history. Right? There's a revisionist history that's created in opposition to this historical narrative. As I said before uh, at the beginning of the series, um, the concept of revisionist history can be used in a positive sense and it can be used in a negative sense. I listed the, the ways in which was the, the concept of revisionist history can be positive and the ways in which revisionist history can be negative. And obviously I'm using revisionist history in this sense as a positive thing. Right? So what ends up happening is um, the oppressed recognize that their narrative isn't included in this historical narrative. They attempt to revise that narrative by saying, hey, you need to talk about me in that narrative. You know, you need to talk about, so for example, with respect to that, um, the role of African Americans, African Americans say, you need to talk about the, the fact that we helped build this nation. We need to be um, acknowledged for our contributions. A failure to acknowledge us in this historical narrative necessitates that I create this new narrative that acknowledges myself, right? We have to be our own cheerleaders, in a sense. What ends up happening is that there's this revised narrative, right? Revised narrative. So we move to this revised narrative, and from that revised narrative, we create our own political identity. But what we immediately see, and this is what Du Bois is saying, is that this political identity, the political identity that comes as a consequence of the orthodox um, um, narrative, is in stark contrast to the political identity that came as a manifold consequence of the heterodox discourse. Right? And I apologize if it seems overly complicated. I'm not trying to do that. Right? But um, And again, back to the example that I think should sort of run true to everybody because we all experience this. In the in the um, sort of Obama's race uh, discourse and all the things that came up with respect to um, his pastor, um, whether or not, I, I don't even care about the politics of it, but what ended up happening is that there was an allegation that our discourse, our, our political identity is vastly different from the majority's political identity. We are the people who built and contributed and were exploited without recognition and this group is saying we are the people that fought for our independence from Britain and we are entitled to whatever. Despite the fact that we're, this, individuals of this group could classify themselves as Americans, loosely Americans, and these people classify themselves as Americans, what we recognize is two starkly different, different forms of political identity. Right, so the fact that we are all labeling ourselves Americans, or it could be any country, right? Or the fact that we're all labeling ourselves Americans doesn't address the historical memory, right? It doesn't address the, the, the role that historical memory played in the formation of our separate political identities. So what we need to do is we need to find a way in which, uh, and there will always be, as far as I'm concerned, there will always be an orthodox, an orthodoxy and a heterodoxy. There will also always be a dominant class and um, an oppressed class. The question is, given the fact that there is a dominant class and an oppressed class, how is it that we can get to a point where political identity is shared and not separate, despite the fact that we have two different um, levels of power here? Obviously, greater power here, less power here. So the attempt is, on the next page, on page five, to illustrate a method in which we can arrive at a shared political identity despite the stark distinctions in power. So let's look at how that, how that unfolds. So it begins the same, right? We have the orthodoxy here, and we have the heterodoxy here. Um, there is a allegedly shared historical narrative, just like before. The difference is, however, is that the revisionist history is shared. The difference is that this is shared unlike before. In a sense, the orthodoxy has to be, quote unquote, willing to amend or revise its history. Right? So a quick example would be the role that abolitionists played in um, the collection of slave narratives. Obviously, slaves at the time were forbidden from learning to read or write. Abolitionists went and collected the narratives of slaves. The reason that they collected the narratives of slaves 
they being the orthodoxy, was to make sure that the narratives of those who couldn't speak for themselves, later I'll talk about the subaltern, but the narratives of those who couldn't speak for themselves was included in this main historical narrative, right? So sort of the role of abolitionists would be an example of this, right? So that the revisionist history now is shared between both the heterodoxy and the orthodoxy. And what we have is a collectively revised, what we have is a collectively revised uh, narrative, right? Which leads to a unified political identity. Right? So, unlike the last example where political identity was um, segmented between the heterodox um, historical memory and the orthodox historical memory, we recognize that there always going to be there's always going to be um, an imbalance in power. Some group is going to have the majority is going to have more power than the minority. Despite the fact that the majority has the orthodox has more power than the minority, we can still arrive at a unified political identity if the minority is willing, quote unquote, willing to um, sort of engage in this revisionist history. As a collective, let's all sit down at the same table and look at what we did, look at where we came from, address this, this dealing with the past, right? Dealing with the past. Here's the past, here's the present. We're dealing with the past, so this would be, uh, um, let me see if I can pronounce it again. This would be Vodangan uh, Heis Beitigon, right? This dealing with the past, let's collectively deal with our past so that we can have a unified um, a unified future. Right? So this, this reinvestigation is this dealing with the past, right? It's sort of located here. And the argument is um, within the United States of America, and not just America, within you know, almost every nation, this schism, the split in political identity can be circumvented by a shared collective reflection, right? This attempt to um, engage in uh, historical um, and revised history through this dealing with the past, right? We both deal with what we've done for good or for bad and we'll arrive at a shared uh, political identity. And obviously the, the, the assumption here is that a unified political identity makes the, the state stronger than a separate political identity. Where the political identity of a nation is split, as in the first example, um, the state is destabilized, right? Um, and this is arguably what's going on in much of the Middle East now, right? You have um, an elite class and you have everybody else. The elite class as a minority is dominating, controlling all of the majority, and they're recognizing that this split in political identity is only serving the advantage of the elite. So revolt is inevitable, right? Revolt, revolt really is, in, it's just a matter of time. Revolt is inevitable where political identity is split. Um, so it's important to circumvent revolt, to circumvent um, that problem that our political identity is shared. Okay, so the point is the difference in these two figures results from a schism in the interpretation on the degree of flexibility in a nation's historical narrative, right? The more flexible we as a population are, we as Americans are, to revisit or deal with our past, um, the more likely it is that we'll arrive at a unified political identity. All right, I'll say that again. So the more willing we are as a nation to engage in this process of dealing with the past, the more likely it is that we'll arrive at a unified political identity. Obviously, conversely, the less likely we, likely we are to engage in this process of dealing with the past, the more likely we are to arrive at a, a split political identity. And then the conclusion from that is, where there is a split in political identity, um, the dominant discourse is always going to be in opposition to the heterodox discourse, and revolt is inevitable, right? Revolt is, 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 is inevitable. So that's, uh, that's important. Um, so, the, the the question then is, what are you know what are the causes for the volatility between orthodoxy and heterodoxy? Um, as far as I'm concerned, it is impossible. I'm not a utopist at all. I'm very pragmatic, right? So I don't believe in a state of affairs where uh, egalitarianism as a theory, maybe egalitarianism as a political identity. I don't believe it. I, I don't believe that state of affairs can exist. 
So the question becomes, if it's the case 